Minister, how will Iran respond if President Trump pulls out of the nuclear deal next month? Uh, well, as you know, uh, over the past uh, 14 months, 15 months since President Trump has been in office, uh, he has not actually lived up to the deal. He has taken, uh, and his administration, uh, have taken every measure uh, in order to make sure that Iran does not benefit uh, economically from the deal. Uh, so if, if the decision comes uh, from President Trump to officially withdraw from the deal, then Iran uh, will take decisions uh, that have been provided for uh, under the JCPOA and outside JCPOA. Uh, as as the United States uh, has a habit of saying all options are on the table. So all options are on the table for Iran too. You said that if the U.S. pulls out, the outcome will be unpleasant. What did you mean by that? Well, first of all, uh, it will lead to U.S. isolation in the international community. Uh, the reason uh, that President Trump has not withdrawn from the deal over the past 15 months, in spite of the fact that he did not like the deal, uh, has been uh, the fact that uh, everybody has advised the administration that uh, this is not a bilateral agreement between Iran and the United States and withdrawing from it uh, would be seen by the international community uh, as a, an indication that the United States is not a reliable partner uh, in the international community. So from the perspective of uh, the U.S. Uh, presence in the international community, uh, it would not be pleasant for the United States, the reaction of the international community. And as I said, Iran has many options, and those options are not pleasant. Not pleasant, but when, if the U.S. pulls out of the nuclear deal, will Iran continue to abide by its terms? Because as you say, there are other signatories to this, Russia, China, the European powers. Well, uh, as I said, Iran has many options, uh, but if the benefits of the deal for Iran uh, start to diminish, uh, then there is no reason for Iran to remain in the deal. Because it's uh, not acceptable for us to have a one-sided agreement. If the U.S. and its allies come to their own agreement on the sidelines to address some of the things that President Trump is concerned about, will you accept that? No, because uh, what is important is for uh, the Europeans to bring the United States into compliance because Iran has been in compliance with the deal. Uh, it's been the United States that has failed to comply. Because particularly, you think the sanctions are still impacting? Uh, well, uh, note President Trump has made it very clear that it is trying to dissuade uh, our economic partners from engaging with Iran and that's a clear violation of the deal. So I think if, if uh, European members of, uh, of the nuclear agreement, uh, the E3, want to uh, make the deal work, uh, they have to make the deal sustainable. Mm -hmm. And in order to make it sustainable, it's not to uh, uh, address the additional demands of the United States, but bring the United States in compliance with its uh, obligations already undertaken under the deal. Well, President Trump says he wants to, to fix the deal. Uh, next week, you've got the president of France coming soon after, the leader of Germany, to try to persuade the president that they can do the things he's concerned about. They can resolve that. Do you think there's a chance of, of saving this international agreement? Well, saving this international agreement is uh, through United States uh, complying with it. Uh, otherwise, it would indicate to the international community that uh, you cannot reach an agreement with the United States and accept it, expect it to be uh, observed. You believe that, as you've said, the president, in your view, is unpredictable and unreliable. Are you saying no power, North Korea or anyone else, will come to an agreement with America if they break this? Well, countries will make their own decisions, but obviously this would be a very bad precedent that if the United States sends this message to the international community, that the length or the duration of any agreement would depend on the duration of the presidency, uh, that would mean people will at least think twice before they start negotiating with the United States. But it sounds because like negotiations in, uh, involve give and take, uh, and people will not be prepared to give if the take is only temporary. 
It sounds like you're saying it's it's President Trump's move on this. You're going to see what he does on May 12th if he puts sanctions back on Iran, and then you'll decide what the consequences will be. No, we have put a number of options for ourselves, and those options are ready, uh, including options that would involve uh, resuming at a much greater speed our uh, nuclear uh, activities. Uh, and those are all uh, envisaged uh, within the deal, and those options are ready to be implemented, and we will make the necessary decision uh, when we see fit. You're ready to restart your nuclear program if President Trump puts sanctions back on Iran, even if the rest of the world says don't do this? Obviously, the rest of the world cannot ask us to unilaterally and one-sidedly uh, implement a deal that has already been broken. President Trump offered to meet with your president, President Rouhani, at the United Nations, and Iran said no. Uh, he made a, a very negative and insulting speech before the General Assembly, and while he was making that speech, uh, they approached us. Uh, and we believe that the first requirement for uh, any bilateral meeting is mutual respect. And if the president is not prepared to provide that, exercise that mutual respect, then a meeting would not produce any positive results. Would you be open to a meeting between the two leaders now? I mean, they've got to hash out these disagreements about the nuclear deal. Well, we have possibilities within uh, the uh, nuclear agreement uh, for our officials to meet, and they are meeting. Uh, we have to see whether they produce uh, the necessary positive outcome. What does President Rouhani think of President Trump? You've got to ask him. <laughs> does he think he can trust him? Well, uh, it, uh, I, I think the international community has seen that uh, the United States, uh, and I do not want to personalize this, that seen the United States under this administration has not been uh, in a mood uh, to fulfill its obligations. So that makes the United States not very trustworthy. You're talking about the Trump administration. Well, uh, CIA Director Mike Pompeo was a very harsh critic of this deal when he was in Congress. Uh, he is very close to the president. Now he's the nominee to become Secretary of State. Do you re read his nomination as a sign this deal is done? Uh, well, uh, every indication that the United States is sending um, uh, appointments, statements uh, indicate to us and the international community that the United States is not serious about its international obligations. Mike Pompeo, if he gets confirmed as Secretary of State, would be America's top diplomat. He would be your peer. Would you be able to work with him? Well, as I said, the requirement for any uh, international engagement is mutual respect. We will have to wait and see. You'd have to wait and see. You haven't met Mike Pompeo before, no, have you? No, I haven't, no. Do you think he can be the kind of diplomat that you could negotiate with? Like, you had a relationship with the prior Secretary of State and were able to come to this kind of agreement. Do you see anything possible with the Trump administration? Well, uh, as I said, the indications that we have seen up until now have not been very encouraging. We will have to uh, wait to make a judgment on the new Secretary of State. Pompeo has spoken in the past about striking Iran. John Bolton, the president's new national security advisor, uh, has said the goal should be regime change in your country. Do you think that as national security advisors, they're going to be honest brokers with the president presenting him with these diplomatic options? Uh, is that a diplomatic option? <laughs> Uh, I think that has been... Uh, well, that's what I'm saying, though. Are they... Does this... Their appointments make military confrontation more likely? Or do you still see the possibility to negotiate? Well, I, I think the United States has never abandoned uh, the idea of regime change in Iran. 
Now they are more explicit about stating it. Uh, but, but the point is, uh, they're used to dictators uh, in our region uh, who rely on them. Uh, as President Trump said, uh, we cannot live without U.S. support for two weeks. That's the type of regime uh, that they're used to, and that is why they so readily talk about regime change. Uh, they have not been able to impact the decision of the Iranian people over the last 40 years. Even at times when uh, the Iranian revolution was very new, uh, that uh, I mean, a war was imposed on Iran uh, for eight years, the entire international community the Iran -Iraq war. I mean, supported Saddam Hussein. People should not forget history. Saddam Hussein, who became uh, the biggest monster in the world for, from a Western perspective, used to be the ally of the West for eight years when he used chemical weapons against Iran. Mm -hmm. So they went to, to the length, to the extreme of trying to force out uh, this government, to, to try to uh, I mean, they imposed all sorts of sanctions against Iran for 40 years. Uh, so that's an illusion. Now, it would be unfortunate uh, if somebody in the White House uh, would consider that illusion uh, a possibility. Uh, that would be, I think, dangerous for the United States, and that would be a waste of time and resources for the United States. But since we depend on our people, uh, since the Iranians uh, have been the major source of our stability, of our strength, uh, then uh, we should not be worried about this. I mean, they, as I said, they have mistaken Iran with their allies, both former allies in Iran as well as their allies in the region, who well, according to President Trump will not last without U.S. support for two weeks. Well, they would say they look at that the protests that recently happened in Iran, some of the economic and financial difficulties that you've gestured to and say, Iran is not in a position to dictate terms and they should be accepting what we are uh, arguing for here in terms of making further commitments to freeze the nuclear program well after the 10 year sunset of the existing nuclear deal. Well, Why not agree to Well, first of all, uh, you have protests in the United States. Uh, most democracies, most countries, with a political process, have protests. Uh, nobody considers those protests as an end of the government, unless you want to entertain illusions. Uh, so, uh, and we're not dictating. We're just living up to an agreement that was reached. It is the United States which wants to dictate. And if you look at U.S. track record, it's not a bright track record in our region. So it's, I mean, better for the United States to take another look at our region, uh, see uh, the mistakes it has made in the past, and try not to repeat them. Under the existing deal, Iran has promised to stay more than one year away from a so-called breakout. Uh, that's a U.S. Able. calculation. It's not any promise that we have made because we never wanted to produce a bomb. Hmm. Uh, and, and now Mr. Pompeo uh, uh, obviously has said that in his testimony in Congress that Iran was never racing towards a bomb and it will not be racing towards a bomb. It's a late admission, but better late than never. Uh, so for us, uh, breakout was not an issue because we were not planning to break out. But that was the basis for U.S. calculations. Not, nothing in the deal uh, itself uh, gives uh, that idea of a breakout any credibility within the deal. He did say that. Mike Pompeo did say that, that Iran was not racing towards building a bomb. But, so they, but they, put, they put sanctions on Iran at that time because we were not racing for a bomb. And now they want to reimpose sanctions on Iran because we're not racing for a bomb. It's interesting. But, but, but to the point, though, if it is such a settled issue, why not make another pledge saying, sure. Why should we? After the end of this deal, we still won't want why to should build we? a, a why bomb. Why should we? There was, there was a negotiation. In fact, there were two, 20, 12 years of negotiations. I remember. And there was an agreement that was reached after hours upon hours of negotiations. That agreement included give and take for the United States to come after the agreement. Obviously, the United States, as President Obama said, did not want Iranian 
uh, nuclear program to remain intact. He said that I will not allow and not, would not have allowed the nut and bolt in the Iranian nuclear program had I been able to. But, but in the negotiations, a negotiation by definition is a process of give and take. And the United States had to accept certain uh, conditions. We had to accept certain limitations. But you won't say we in cannot, the future we don't intend to build a bomb. I mean, that, that's, that's very clear. That. It is in the, in, the, in the nuclear agreement. It's not that clear Iran, to President Trump, though. This well, is one I mean, of the things he's uh, he, most concerned I mean, that's, about. Uh, that's, the sunset that's clause, three, specifically. three lines down the preface to the agreement. It says Iran commits itself never to develop a nuclear weapon. Um, I mean, you don't, you don't need even to read the entire 150 pages of the, of the deal. Just read the first three lines, and it's there. There is no sunset to the fact that Iran will never seek nuclear weapons. So I want to ask you about uh, some of the prisoners um, in this country and uh, in, your, in your country. There are about five Americans being held in Tehran, including a scholar from Princeton, um, an 81-year-old man who we've talked about, Bakr Namazi, who is of failing health. What are their conditions right now? Well, as you, as you pointed out, there are many Iranian prisoners, both in the United States as well as uh, people who, I mean, including a lady who had to give birth uh, in an Australian prison uh, because of a U.S. extradition request. Uh, our judiciary uh, is an independent organ, um, just what you would say about your courts, uh, and uh, we cannot have an impact on the decisions of our judiciary, but we have been trying to use uh, our influence from a humanitarian perspective, uh, first of all, in, in order to uh, make sure that uh, their health, their health requirements are taken care of, as well as to see whether a humanitarian agreement can be reached. But would you agree to sit down with the Trump administration to talk about these prisoners? Well, it is, it is important, as I said, for the administration to show the ability to engage in a respectful discourse. Well, they've said they've made an offer to Iran. We want to sit down and talk to you about these consular visits It's not an offer, it's a demand. But before, before you make demands, uh, the United States needs to uh, learn how to treat other sovereign nations, particularly sovereign nations who do not depend on the United States for continued existence and who can live without U.S. support, not only for two weeks, but for 40 years. So you don't want to sit down and negotiate about this, but no, is there I didn't something say that. you'd want to I see? I said the United States needs to approach this from a position of dealing with another sovereign government. And if that approach were to change, then the United States would see a different result. What does that mean? What do you want to see? Respect. How? Disrespect. You do not engage in negotiations by uh, exercising disrespect for a country, for its people, uh, for its government by tr openly uh, making uh, claims, including uh, this illusion about regime change, uh, then you do not leave much room for a genuine dialogue. So a prisoner swap in the future, like you had with the Obama administration, you don't see that happening again? Uh, well, it is, it is a possibility, certainly from a humanitarian perspective. But, but it requires a change of attitude. And a change of language from the president? And a change that, of language. Is that what you're looking for? Um, well, speaking of the president, in his speech before bombing Syria, President Trump said to Iran and to Russia, I ask, what kind of a nation wants to be associated with the mass murder of innocent men, women, and children? Has Iran asked Bashar al-Assad to stop using chemical weapons in Syria? Uh, well, let me first tell the president what kind of a nation wants to provide the airplanes that are bombing Yemeni children to smitherness, Yemeni cities and towns. The United States is not only uh, providing the weapons, but according to Secretary of Defense, even engaged actively in what amounts to war crimes. As far as chemical weapons are concerned, Iran has been a victim of chemical weapons, so we Others talk about red lines, but we know they don't have red lines. 
these are just political. We were victims of chemical weapons, and now the record during the Iran-Iraq war, during the Iran-Iraq Iran Iraq war, Iran and now the record is out that the United States not only stayed quiet but even provided support. But will in Iran the use. stay so, quiet now about no, Syria we don't. using we won't. chemical we won't. weapons? Hold on. So we won't stay quiet, but the United States cannot say that they have a red line. We have rejected the use of chemical weapons, regardless of the victims or culprits, regardless of the victims or perpetrators. But we have said that there has to be an international on-site investigation. Who used the chemical weapons, how they were used, whether they were used, and then there should be an international reaction. We have a body of documents called international law. And we have a Security Council, we have means when the Security Council is prevented from taking action by a veto to go to the General Assembly. So there are possibilities. People should not take the law into their own hands, particularly when it serves their political interest. It is interesting when the United States uh, claims to be defending international law against the use of chemical weapons, and at other times, supporting uh, violations of other humanitarian law principles. So what is important is to have a one standard, a single standard, and that is what we say. We condemn the use of chemical weapons, we want an international on-site investigation, and based on that, we want an international response, not unilateral action by countries taking the law into their own the hands. The weapons inspectors can't get to the site right now. Will Iran, which has boots on the ground, let those inspectors into those sites? Will you help facilitate what you're talking about? Well, I don't know what you mean by boots on the ground. We have advisors in Syria, but fighters and advisors. We, we do uh, encourage, as we have in the past, uh, Syria to cooperate with uh, on-site impartial investigation. Has Iran talked to Bashar al-Assad about using chemical weapons and say, our don't position, do this? Our position on the use of chemical weapons is crystal clear for everybody. For, so you for have everybody. For Assad as well? For everybody. And we, we, we have not made any uh, conditions on our rejection of the use of chemical weapons. D it must make you uncomfortable to see the use of barrel bombs and chemical weapons in Syria. It, it, makes us, the regime. it makes us uncomfortable to see the continuation of bloodshed in our region because there are some uh, rather young and ambitious leaders who believe that they can have military victory in Yemen. They believe that they could have military victory in Yemen in two weeks. They believe that they could unseat uh, Bashar al-Assad. You're talking uh, about in, Saudi Arabia now. Uh, and, and, and company uh, <laughs> who believe that they could unseat Bashar al-Assad in, in, in three weeks. Uh, now we are in, in the, close to the end of the seventh year of conflict in, in Syria, uh, into the fourth year of conflict in, in Yemen. I believe these illusions need to be abandoned. There are no military solutions to the crises in our region. People have to admit and accept that people of the, of the country, of Syria, of Yemen, need to sit together and reach a political solution. Iran has been calling for that. We have supported that in Syria, in the Astana process, in the Sochi process, and we will continue to do that. Others are trying to impede, prevent, and destroy that process. And I believe it's now time for them to come to their senses and accept a political outcome. They should, they should abandon the fact that they can use the United States in order to change the political realities on the ground. President Trump says he wants to bring U.S. troops in Syria back home, draw them down. What do you think about that? I think the presence of the United States troops in Syria has been illegal to begin with, uh, against every principle of international law, no grounds for it, and they have been destabilizing. U.S. policy in Syria, particularly over the last few months, has been short-sighted. Uh, further uh, exacerbates uh, ethnic tensions in Syria, has led to uh, regional reactions that are uh, dangerous. Uh, and I believe the sooner they bring them to an end, uh, the better it is for the region and for the United States. There is concern that if the U.S. withdraws, Iran will commit more advisors, more fighters to Syria. Iran has committed advisors in order to fight extremism and terrorism. 
We did that in Syria, we did that in Iraq, we did that in Iraqi Kurdistan. Uh, this has been a consistent policy that Iran has followed in the region. Our policy has been very consistent. I think the United States is simply trying to find excuses to prevent an end to this nightmare. Israel is very concerned about the Iranian presence in Syria and has bombed an Iranian base there. They have vowed to continue to push back on Iran's presence near their borders. Do you see what you're describing as us headed towards a regional war? I do not believe that uh, we are headed towards regional war, but I do believe that, uh, unfortunately, uh, Israel has continued its violations of international law, uh, hoping to be able to do it with impunity uh, because of the U.S. support, and trying to find smoke screens uh, to hide behind. And uh, I do not believe uh, that the smoke screens work anymore. You don't think this escalates tensions when they they have on escal Iranian bases? They have, they have, in fact, escalated tension by violating Syrian airspace, by violating Syrian uh, territory uh, the on Russians a routine... The Russians weren't able to shoot them down, didn't on, even try. On a routine basis. Actually, Syrians were able to, to shoot one of their planes down. The drone. Putting, put, no, no, no. A, a, uh, I don't know whether it was an F-16 or a fighter jet, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, putting, they put an end to the Israeli invincibility uh, myth uh, in our region. So they, they should expect that if they continue to violate uh, territorial integrity of other states, uh, there'll be consequences. The easiest answer would, would be to stop, to stop these acts of aggression, to stop these incursions. There are a number of flashpoints in the next month. Do you see a way out for the U.S. and Iran to de-escalate? Um, I, I think w what uh, the U.S. has followed in the region, including one of the flashpoints, which would be the opening of the uh, embassy in Jerusalem, is an affront to the entire uh, Muslim world, is an, is an affront to international law. Uh, and I believe the United States would be much uh, better served if they followed a, more, a wiser, more prudent policy in our region. Minister Zarif, thank you for your time. Good to be with you again.